Live from the BDN Studios, it's Bang and Dang. That's awesome. If you don't like that, then you ain't black. Welcome back to the Battles of American Civil War with Charles Bang and Dang as we continue on 1864, the Overland Campaign, the Atlanta Campaign. Mm -hmm. Plus, we got the Wilson Colts raid that we're uh, going to cover a battle from today, which is part of technically the uh, Siege of, Siege of Petersburg. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, this first battle that we got, St. Mary's Church, is the last of the Overland Campaign before we officially set into the Siege of Petersburg. So, uh, Overland Campaign didn't didn't do, uh, yeah, it's the last one of that. Didn't do what Grant wanted it to do, so didn't guess what? We're going to Siege Petersburg no for uh, about a year. He's still got Scheumann and he's marching. He is indeed. We got a lot of that. Uh Atlanta battles coming up though before he starts a marching. This episode we got St. Mary's Church, the Staunton River Bridge, St. Mary's Church bad last battle of Overland Campaign. Then we got the Staunton River Bridge, which is a Wilson Colts raid and Battle of Kennesaw Mountain, which we go back to Georgia. Kennesaw? Didn't we already have like a Kennesaw Ridge or something like that? Maybe. Sounds I just familiar. realized. Sounds familiar. Is it wasn't the commissioner of baseball Kennesaw Mountain Landis or something like that? Right. Obviously uh, named after this. Uh, Right? right? Right. Before we get into these three battles, go check out our YouTube at Bang Dang Network. We post shorts, clips, exclusive Dart League, our only uh, video series that's on YouTube as well. But if you guys want to see pictures of like the battles, the battlegrounds, or like famous paintings of the battles or whatever, the, we put those up on the YouTube during each battle. So, I mean, if you're a visual kind of feller or lady... Go over to YouTube at Bang Dang Network. Give us a subscription. If you just listen on Apple, Spotify, share with your friends. Give us a review and answer that Spotify question. Damn right. Starting out, Battle of St. Mary's Church, also called Samaria, Sam Maria, Samaria Church, which, oh, Brent, which they oh, called Sam it in Maria. the South. Or it's also it's called. A church in the South. Or it's also called Nancy Shop. Sometimes Shot. they call it. Nancy Shaw. Wow. Ooh. If only you would have done it on beat. Anyways. The Civil War battle. Right. It was in a, it was a cavalry battle fought June 24th as part of, uh, obviously the Overland campaign. Following that battle of Trevilian Station, we had a couple, uh, episodes ago, 11th through the 12th of June. Sheridan's cavalry began to return on June 13th from there. <laughs> Look at Sheridan becoming the best, uh, cavalry general in the whole army right now well the one Since that everybody else died. the one that was was dead <laughs> so uh his, two of them was it long street calvary long street's not dead i mean uh uh but, stonewall stone no he wasn't calvary no jeb was still rolling around when long street was wrong i mean uh jackson was rolling around that's right yeah but yeah look at that old sharon and went from fifth to the best now yeah, did he though who else is better right now I don't think he has a choice at this point. AP Hill? Eh, not a cavalry commander, though. Or uh, Lee? Not a cavalry commander. Fitz you? I thought he is. No, he's he? not a commander. No, we'll see. Actually, I don't know if it's this episode or next episode. Uh, one of the guys finally gets finally gets uh, promoted. Yeah, oh, shit. And it's not Fitz you. Oh. Uh, following the Battle of Trevelyan well, Station. He, he couldn't really do that as his nephew. I mean, everybody would be like, Ugh. And? Yeah. And you ain't got that because you're your nephew. Chamberlain's brother or something was like his aide de camp, right hand man guy. So yeah, that's fine. Mm, why? Same thing. That's really nobody but a gopher. <laughs> Anyways, following the Battle of Trevilian Station for the seventeenth time, uh, Sheridan's cavalry began to return June thirteenth from their unsuccessful raid against the Virginia Central Railroad. Yeah, they wanted that damn railroad. They didn't get it though. They crossed the North Anna River at Carpenter's Ford and then headed on the Cartharpin Road. In the direction of Spotsylvania Courthouse. June 16th, the column passed through Bowling Green and traveling along the north bank of the Mattapony River arrived at King and Queen Courthouse June 18th. You guys are on the move. On the move. Well, Sheridan's men were off on their raid. It's off on their little raid. Right. Oh, Ulysses S. Grant's army had begun moving from Cold Harbor to cross the James River for an attack against Petersburg. In conjunction with this move, Grant ordered that his principal supply base be moved from the White House on the Pamunkey River I know. to City Point on the James's River. A lot of these people that listen all the time are probably like, dude, we've already went over this. But you got to recap for the people that are just tuning right. in on this episode, you know? Well, at that time, Sheridan learned that the White House depot had not yet been broken up. 
so he went his wound. Oh. He went. He wetted. He wetted his wounds. So, so he sent his wounded, his prisoners, and African Americans who had been following his column to the White House under escort. Not the White House, right? On the nineteenth of June. Oh, Juneteenth over there. Right. Uh, well, look at him. He's protecting all these guys. He's like, you guys, especially you African Americans, they're gonna fucking kill you if right. you are with me. So get your ass over there and do what you can to help the wounded and keep those prisoners in line. <laughs> and then. He marched back to Dunkirk, where he could cross the Mattapony. Well, all right. Look at that shit. Good for him, Sheridan. Uh, Lieutenant General Hampton's Confederate Cavalry left Trevilian Station and followed Sheridan on a roughly parallel road to the south. His force consisted of Brigadier General Matthew Butler's and Brigadier General Thomas Rosser's, Rosser's brigades from his own division, Brigadier General William C. Wickham's brigade from Major General Fitzhugh Lee's division, and Brigadier, Gen- Brigadier General John Chambliss's brigade from Major General W.H.F. Rooney Chambliss. Lee's brigade. Yeah, where's Chambliss been? He's still alive. Uh, he added a newly formed cavalry brigade under Brigadier General Martin Gary for this as well. Oh, look, look at that. that. Newly formed. Right. Fantastic. You never see that in uh, the old Rebs. Newly formed. Wow. 20th of June, 1864. Fitz Lee attempted to attack the Union Supply Depot at White House. But, shit, not that White House, guys. Right. But Sheridan's arrival relieved the garrison there. 21st of June, 1864. Sheridan crossed over the Pamunkey River. Broke through the old rebel cordon at the St. Peter's Church. Led 900 wagons toward the James River. He's Damn. on a row, baby. They crossed the... Uh, Chickahominy River on the 22nd of June and also on the 23rd of June. It'll take a while to get 900 wagons over. Bypassing stiff opposition south of Jones Bridge on the 23rd of June, Hampton had been unable to intercept Sheridan prior to this. So he crossed at the Chickahominy upstream from the Union crossing and hastened south. He's like, all right, who's going to get there first? Let's do this, boys. Well, Sheridan headed toward Deep Bottom on his way to link up with the Union infantry at Bermuda 100. Near Westover Church, where Union Brigadier General Alfred T. A. Torbert's division was stalled by Confederate resistance. June 24th, Brigadier General David Gregg's division occupied a covering position near Samaria Church on the road to Charles City, while Sheridan ferried Torbert's division and the supply train across the James at Duthit's Landing. Oh wow! All right. Okay, so we're gonna we're we're about to collide here after we cross rivers, huh? Dude, it's crazy to think back then. A mile away from each other would seem like a, a major distance. That's just from here down to the bridge. You imagine 30,000 soldiers, and you know not too far down the road is 30 th- other thousand soldiers just waiting. It's well, not only that. Easy. Spoil alert. Next week's episode is going to feature the battle that Jeb Stewart got uh, the closest to Washington, which was only three miles from the White House. Right. So. That's from here down to the to, 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 to yeah to right dead end right holy shit right and he had like sixty thousand with him so mm. yeah crazy insane twenty fourth of June Torbert's division continued to escort the wagons toward Harrison's Landing on the James River as Gregg's division followed a parallel route protecting the right flank protect that flank. Torbert, he encountered Brigadier General Lunsford Lomax's brigade. What a hell of a name. Dude's name is Lunsford L. Lomax. Yeah, triple, triple L, L, L up in his bitch. He met his brigade near the Charles City Courthouse, and he drove it back. About 8 a.m., Greg's brigade under Brigadier General Henry Davies, Jr., they arrived in the vicinity of St. Maria Church at the intersection of three roads where they found rebel pickets. A charge by the 2nd Pennsylvania Cavalry pushed the pickets to the north, and Davies' brigade entrenched to the west of the intersection. Davies took up the right flank of the line, and Colonel J. Irvin Gregg, General Gregg's cousin, All right. he uh, he went to the left. Now oh, Hampton's force approached and prepared to attack dismounted, oh. while simultaneously entrenching at the same time. They're like, we can attack and entrench Damn at right. the same time. Damn right. uh, from 3 to 4 p.m., Hampton's five brigades attacked Gregg's two. Uh-oh. The pressure was too great on the Union cavalrymen, and they began to withdraw down the road to Charles City Courthouse, mm. which they reached about 8 p.m. Skirmishing lasted until 10 p.m. One of the Confederates wrote, the enemy position was a strong one. They fought vigorously for a while, but as our boys closed in on them, they fled, and when they broke the mounted cavalry, was ordered to charge, mm. which they did, driving pell-mell, whatever that means, for three miles, capturing quite a number of prisoners 
they leaving their dead and wounded in our care. Right. And they were just like, I don't care. We're leaving, baby. Right. Hopefully they can get the ground back to get them. But Schwarzer charge, which they did drive in disorderly. For, so they, the Confederates were disorderly for three miles. And when they broke, the mounted cavalry was ordered to charge, which they did drive in disorderly. Yeah, so they were just, just running around rush. fucking right. and taking everybody they can, I guess. Holy shit. Except for the men left behind, Greg's division escaped relatively intact. Among the prisoners, except for you know, right. except for the men left right. behind. Among the prisoners was Colonel Pennock Huey of the Eighth Pennsylvania Cavalry. Casualties were about <laughs> three hundred. Right, <laughs> all right, Pennock. <laughs> he did went on to do like some right. political shit afterwards. Uh, casualties were about three hundred fifty Union, two fifty Confederate. Eh. Having been blocked by Hampton's cavalry, Sheridan withdrew on the twenty fifth of June and moved through Charles City Courthouse to Duthot's Landing, where the trains crossed the James on flatboats. His cavalry followed on June 27th and the 28th. The old rebel cavalry attempted to position themselves for another attack. But the old blue coats was too strong. And the southern horsemen, they were too worn out. Well, we've been chasing these guys for my, literally for eight days now. Right. So come on, give us a rest, dude. Well, just then, though, Hampton received orders from Robert E. Lee to proceed to Petersburg as quickly as possible to deal with the Wilson Colts raid against the railroad south of the city. His men crossed the James on a pontoon bridge at Chaffin's Bluff, also on June 27th and 28th. Hampton was brilliant that hot, dry summer. All right. Okay, this is a quote. This is a quote by uh, a guy named Eric J. Wittenberg, who wrote a book called Glory Enough for All. Oh. He says, Hampton was brilliant that hot, dry summer, demonstrating his prowess as a fighter and only slightly restrained by the toll taken on his horses and men. He chased the Union cavalry all over Virginia and thrashed it each time they met. Nice. An early Confederate cavalry historian proclaimed that the Trevilian raid demonstrated anew that the Confederate cavalry under Hampton was just as enterprising, as valiant, as enthusiastic, and as brave and dauntless as when it fought under Stuart. Well, you guys just were introduced to the new uh, cavalry commander. <laughs> wow. Uh, yes. Uh, Sheridan. It's not official yet, but this is going to be. Sheridan's again. reign as best cavalry commander has was very short. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right, Hampton. <laughs> Sheridan's raid to Trevilian Station and back to the Army of the Potomac achieved mixed results. He successfully diverted old rebel attention from Grant's crossing That's of the James River, needed. but he was very unsuccessful in his objective of cutting the Virginia Central Railroad. Yeah, I mean, this was a critical supply line to Confederate capital and Lee's army. Is there still a Confederate capital? I mean, come on. Yeah, it's been untouched. All right. Come on, Jefferson Davis. Why aren't you out there like leading? Well, he's the president. Is he? <laughs> well, officially, yes. Right. He also suffered relatively heavy casualties as well, as did uh, Sheridan, particularly in his officer corps, and a large yeah. number of his horses to battle and heat exhaustion. Ooh, he yep. can't lose, lose horses. That's like losing men. And yet, Sheridan claimed his raid was an undeniable victory. Well, of course he did. In his 1866 official report on operations, he wrote this. The result was constant success and the almost total annihilation of the rebel cavalry. We marched when and where we pleased. We're always the attacking party and always successful. We just read a battle where you just lost. Well, of course. <laughs> but obviously, we got propaganda. Well, let's see your propaganda. <laughs> the results of Hampton's cavalry activities against Sheridan were also mixed, but are usually seen in a more positive light than Sheridan's. Oh. He had succeeded in protecting the railroads and indirectly Richmond. He also achieved tactical victories on the second day of Trevilian Station and against Greg at St. Maria Church, but failed to destroy the Union Cavalry or its trains. In August, he was named Commander of the Cavalry Corps of the Army of Northern Virginia, filling the much-needed void that remained open since the death mm. of Jeb Stewart. Yeah, so he earned it, though, buddy. Hampton, you earned it, buddy. Crazy You shit. earned it, buddy. Crazy Good for stuff. you. Right. Hampton. It's not, I mean, too little, too late, though, so. Right. No uh, <laughs> Civil War Trust uh, uh, getting any. his partners, huh? No partners no, here. No battlefield. Uh, I don't think it was really a battlefield. They kept running. That's they true. were, like, chasing each other. Like, so. dude, we can't do that. It's everywhere. Right. right. That was a decent little battle. I'd have to say it's either inconclusive or a rebel victory. Clearly a rebel victory. Right. Let's move on to the Battle of Staunton River Bridge, June 25th, 1864. Uh, this is Darren Wilson Cotts' raid. The battle took place around the Staunton River Bridge over the Staunton River in Halifax and Charlotte counties in Virginia. All right. During the month of June 1864, Rebel Army General 
Robert E. Lee was commanding the Army of Northern Virginia in the defense of Petersburg. Yeah. Against the Union siege under, as we all know, Ulysses S. Grant. Mm-hmm. The old rebel forces were dependent on the flow of supplies from the south and the west along the south side in Richmond and Danville Railroad lines. Grant, he realized this. Without these supplies, the Confederates would be forced to abandon Petersburg. Thus, Grant decided to dispatch Union cavalry to raid the rail lines and destroy them, thus cutting Lee off from his supplies. Damn. June 22nd, 5,000 Union cavalry and 16 artillery pieces were pulled from the siege of Petersburg and sent under the command of Brigadier Generals James Wilson and August Cox to destroy the lines of supply. Right. During the next three days, despite pursuit and harassment from Confederate cavalry under the command of Major General W.H.F. Rooney Lee, the Union cavalry succeeded and they destroyed 60 miles of that railway. It's ridiculous. I mean, that's a lot of miles. You ain't kidding. That's a major delay in your uh, supplies. Imagine if nobody said nothing and the train just keeps going. Oh, <laughs> just no. Wow. wonder how many times that happened. Right. I bet it happened a lot. Maybe. <laughs> but I hope you can get that bitch up to 88. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the Staunton River Bridge, it runs south, southwest to north, northeast over the River Staunton which itself yeah. runs northwest to southeast. Okay. And along it runs the Richmond and Danville Railroad, which is a vital part of the supply system for the besieged Army of Northern Virginia. Yeah. The bridge was defended by 296 Confederate reservists. Well, that's not a lot. Under the command of Captain Benjamin Farenholt, who had been warned on the 23rd of June that Union Cavalry forces were approaching his position and are coming fast. Heeding this warning, Farron Holt dispatched couriers to the nearby areas of Halifax, Charlotte, and Mecklenburg in order to recruit additional forces. And on the morning of the battle, 642 reinforcements arrived. Oh, man, look at these. You got almost, almost 1,000. Of whom, 150 were regular soldiers and the rest volunteer fighters. Ooh, well, I mean, those volunteers might fight harder than the other ones. Right. Better hope a couple of them have some repeaters. Right. Realizing that he would be under surveillance of Union scouts, Fahrenheit ordered a train to run continuing along the line from his position to a station farther south right. in order to create the impression that he was receiving continual reinforcements. Damn right. Nice. The illusion was further strengthened by Miss Nancy McPhail, Mulberry Hill Plantation owner's wife, who, in addition to hosting Union wounded during the battle, informed the Union forces that up to 10,000 Confederate forces awaited them at the bridge. Yeah, but Later, that's... misinformation campaigns. Right, but that could work out not in the... I was going to say, they could, they could arrive with 30,000 right, because right. they think there's 10,000. Right. Like, 30,000 against these 700, 700 people. people. <laughs> like, oh, no. Jeez. Shit. Oh, well, 938? Jeez, old Pete. In reality, there were only 938 men. <laughs> as well as these 938 men, Farron Holt commanded two earthwork sites on the southern bank of the river. And the position, and he positioned his six artillery pieces accordingly, with four in the fortress on the eastern side of the rail line, two on the western side. He also had constructed a network of concealed rifle trenches between the earthwork defenses and the bridge itself. 3.45 p.m., according to reports by Fahrenheit, the old blue coats arrived on the northern bank of the river within a mile of main redoubt. What? Within a mile of my main redoubt. That's, That's what he quote, says. Quote, unquote. However, Fahrenheit's opening salvo fell short. Cots from the old uh, blue coats dismounted with his cavalry opposite the bridge and advanced from both the east and the west. Oh, shit. Mm, meanwhile, Union Colonel Robert West, who commanded the Union forces <laughs> attacking from the western side of the rail line, attempted to quickly capture the bridge and hold it for sufficient time to set fire to it, oh, no. but his attack was repulsed. Yeah, right. You know, they're fighting for that bridge. All right. The mean, meanwhile, Union forces reached and occupied a drainage ditch situated 150 yards from the bridge, That's nasty. from which they organized four. Oh, yeah, but not, not that bad. <laughs> Back then. Right. Uh, from there, they organized four unsuccessful charges, all of which were repulsed by fire from Fahrenheit's concealed trench systems, which led to heavy Union casualties. No shit. All right. Around sunset, Rooney Lee, he arrived on the field with the Confederate cavalry forces that had been pursuing the Union raiders. Lee attacked the Union forces in the rear, and Wilson was forced to retire by midnight. Mm, by midnight. Right. Following morning, Fahrenheit advanced with skirmishers onto the vacated Union positions. Taking eight prisoners and burying 42 Union dead. Well, at least he buried them. Casualties on the Union side amounted to 42 killed, 44 wounded, 30 missing or captured. The old rebels lost 10 murdered and 24 wounded. Jeez. The defense of Staunton River Bridge ensured the survival of the Richmond and Danville Rail Supply Line for now, which was a key part of the chain supply in the besieged forces in Petersburg. Wow. However, Lee was forced to abandon Petersburg, we know, in April 1865 when they were finally cut those supply lines. 
Part of the area where the battle took place is now preserved as part of the Staunton River Battlefield State Park. And the National and the Confederate defensive fortifications are listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Well, look at that. So they never get in touch. Good Fantastic. for them. Fantastic. Good if for I them. I had a month that I can just do anything, I am going all up and down Pennsylvania, Georgia, Virginia. Man, that would be hell. Tennessee, Arkansas. Yeah, pretty much the east. Right, lower. Because not only that, would it be Civil War? You also got how many Revolutionary War uh, and, battle sites. And and you got a couple famous Wild West cities. Dodge City, which is nothing anymore. Right, so why would you go there? Right. <laughs> Very next battle, our last battle. Battle of Kennesaw Mountain, 27th June, 1864, during the Atlanta campaign. Oh, Sheridan. He's kicking. Oh, Schoeman. Oh, we got right. Schoeman. It was the most significant frontal assault launched by Union Major General William Sherman against the old rebels of the Army of the Tennessee. You got Joseph Johnston, General Joseph Johnston. March, 1864. Ulysses S. Grant was promoted to Lieutenant General and named General in Chief of the Union Army. Mm-hmm. He devised a strategy of multiple simultaneous offenses against the old rebels, hoping to prevent any of the rebel armies from reinforcing the others over interior lines. The two most significant of these were Major General George Meade's Army of Potomac, accompanied by Grant himself, which he let uh, Meade still control it. Fantastic. Kind of. Right. Which he would attack Robert E. Lee directly in advance toward the Confederate capital of Richmond. Which we've clearly just been seeing. And this one we're talking about is Major General William T. Sherman replacing Grant in his role as commander of the Military Division of Mississippi, who would advance from Chattanooga, Tennessee to Atlanta. And Mm -hmm. we all know what he does after Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, both Grant and Sherman initially had objectives to engage with and destroy the two principal armies of the Confederacy. Seek and destroy! Relegating the capture of important enemy cities to a secondary supporting role. Said if you can get them, get them. Mm -hmm. This was a strategy that Abraham Lincoln had emphasized throughout the war, but Grant was the first and only general who actively cooperated Uh, with it. McClellan, um... What was the other one? Butler, all of them. Or uh, Burnside, all, like, all of them. Dumb. Dumb. Well, as their campaigns progressed, <laughs> however, the political importance of the cities of Richmond and Atlanta began to dominate their strategy. But like, wait a minute, if we could take these two cities, we don't even have to take out the whole armies. Uh, by 1864, Atlanta was a critical target. A city of 20,000. Imagine that, 20,000 in Atlanta. Uh, was founded, uh, there's 20,000 in a city block in Atlanta right now. <laughs> right. It was founded at the intersection of four important railroad lines that supplied Confederacy and was a military manufacturing arsenal in its own right. I mean, yeah, that was their last. That was their industrial city of the South, pretty much, besides New Orleans, but that's been captured. Atlanta's nickname of Gate City of the South was a very appropriate nickname. Its capture would open virtually the entire Deep South, the Union Conquest. I'm from the South, mm. the Deep South. <laughs> Grant's orders to Sherman were to move Get against last, Johnston's Adrian. army. To break it up and to get into the interior of the enemy's country as far as you can. Hell yeah. Inflicting all the damage you can against their war. Hell yeah. Against their war resources. Yeah. Sherman's force of 100,000 was composed of three subordinate armies. Army of the Tennessee, which was Grant and later Sherman's army. Uh, under Major General James B. Pearson, the Army of the Cumberland. Under Major General George Thomas and the relatively small Army of the Ohio, composed of only the 23rd Corps under Major General John Schofield. Their principal opponent was the Confederate Army of the Tennessee, commanded by Joseph Johnston, General, who had replaced the unpopular Braxton Bag Bragg after his defeat at Chattanooga. Yeah, well, Bragg didn't do too good. I mean, he started off decent. Now, the fifty thousand man army of that Tennessee consisted of the infantry corps of Lieutenant Generals William Hardy, John Bell Hood, Leonidas Polk. I thought he's dead. Well, he is dead now. Right. And a cavalry corps under Major General Joseph Wheeler. Okay, we got some heavy hitters up in here. Sherman's mm-hmm. campaign began on the seventh of May, as his as his three armies departed from the vicinity of Chattanooga. He launched demonstration attacks against Johnston's position on the long, high mountain named Rocky Face Ridge. Rocky Face Ridge, McPherson's Army of the Tennessee. <laughs> Yeah, McPherson's Army of Tennessee advanced stealthily around Johnston's left flank at this very same time toward the town of Rosaka and Johnston's supply line on the Western Atlantic Railroad. Ooh, gonna get that supply line. 
Unfortunately for Sherman, McPherson encountered a small Confederate force entrenched in the outskirts of Resaca and cautiously pulled back to Snake Creek Gap, squandering the opportunity to trap the old rebel army. Yep, and Sherman, Sherman, <laughs> Sherman. Do we, do we have that? Yes. Yeah, I remember that. Uh, as Sherman swung his entire army in the direction of Resaca, we had the Battle of Resaca, yes. Johnson retired to take up positions there. Full-scale fighting erupted in the Battle of Resaca May 14th to the 15th, but there was no conclusive result. Sherman flanked Johnson for a second time by crossing the Ustanala River. As Johnson withdrew again, skirmishing erupted at Adairsville May 17th, and more general fighting on Johnson's Cassville line May 18th to the 19th. Johnson planned to move... Johnson planned to defeat part of Sherman's force as it approached on multiple routes, but Hood became uncharacteristically cautious and feared encirclement, failing to attack as ordered. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Encouraged by Hood and Polk, Johnson ordered another withdrawal, this time across the Etowah River. Jeez, man. Come on, you guys. Right. Johnson's army took up defensive positions at Alatoona Pass, south of Cartersville. But Sherman once again turned Johnson's left as he temporarily abandoned his railroad supply line. And advanced on Dallas, Georgia. Yup. Johnson, he was then again forced to move from his strong position and meet Sherman's army in the wide open spaces. Mm-hmm. Fierce but inclusive fighting occurred on the 25th of May at New Hope Church, 27th of May, Pickett's Mill, 28th of May in Dallas, Georgia, which we did all those. Sure did. June 1st, heavy rains turned the roads to quagmires, and Sherman was forced to return to the railroad supply with his men. Oh, two supplies, men, yeah. Right. Johnson's new line, called the Brushy Mountain Line, was established by 4th of June, northwest of Marietta, along Lost Mountain, Pine Mountain, and Brush Mountain. All right, well, look at that. June 14th, following 11 days of steady rain, wow, Sherman was ready to move again. While on a personal re- reconnaissance, he spotted a group of Confederate officers on Pine Mountain, ordered one of his artillery batteries to open fire. At this point, old trusty Dusty Lieutenant General Leonidas Polk was killed. Oh, no. Johnson withdrew his men from Pine Mountain, establishing a new line in an arc-shaped defensive position from Kennesaw Mountain to Little Kennesaw Mountain. Hood's Corps attempted an unsuccessful attack at Peter Cobes Farm, which we just did last right. week, Battle of Cobes Farm, which is south of Little Kennesaw Mountain, June 22nd. Major General William Lauren succeeded to temporarily command Polk's Corps. Mm. Wasn't that the, when he was sitting there and the guy just turned around and shot him? Yeah, there was like, no, there, no, that was Jeb. All right. This one, there was like three generals standing right there. Remember the right. artillery shell and it blew him in half or something? Right. right. Yeah. yeah, he got fucked up. Dummy. Sherman was, hmm. Sherman was in a difficult position. He was stalled 15 miles north of Atlanta. He could not continue his strategy of moving around Johnson's flank because of the impassable roads. And his railroad supply was dominated by Johnson's position on the top of 691-foot Kennesaw Mountain. Mm -hmm. He reported to Washington, the whole country is one vast fort, and Johnston must have at least 50 miles of connected trenches with the Betis and Finnish batteries. We gain ground daily, fighting all the time. Our lines are now in close contact, and the fighting incessant. With a good deal of artillery... As fast as we gain one position, the enemy has another already. Kennesaw is the key to the whole country. Mm-hmm. That's what uh Sherman, what he says. That's what Sherman says. We take Kennesaw, we got Atlanta. Well, he decided to break the stalemate by attacking Johnson's position on Kennesaw Mountain. Ooh, wow, that's a big move. He issued orders on the 24th of June for an 8 a.m. attack on the 27th we got three days, of June. Three, three days. <laughs> <laughs> we got three days to get ready, boys. Sherman's plan was to first induce Johnston to thin out and weaken his line by ordering Schofield to so extend st- his army to the right. Stupidest thing he should have done. Then McPherson was to make a feint on his extreme left, the northern outskirts of Marietta and the northeastern end of Kennesaw Mountain with his cavalry and division of infantry, and to make a major assault on the southwestern end of Little Kennesaw Mountain. Uh-oh. Meanwhile, Thomas's army was to conduct a principal attack against the Confederate fortifications in the center of their line, and Schofield was to demonstrate on the Confederate left flank and attack somewhere near the Powder Springs Road, quote-unquote, as he can with the prospect of success. Oh. 8 a.m., 27th of June, exactly three days, as Sherman said. Union artillery opened furious and bombardment with over 200 guns on the old rubber works. Damn. And the rebel artillery responded in kind. Like, all right, you want to get us with guns? We'll get our guns out. Mm-hmm. We'll have a little bit of gunplay. Pow, pow. Pow, pow, pow. Lieutenant Colonel Joseph Fullerton wrote this. Kennesaw smoked and blazed with fire. A volcano as grand as Etna. As the Federal infantry began moving soon afterward, the Confederates quickly determined 
that much of the eight miles wide advance consisted of demonstrations rather than concerted assaults. Like they ain't even not right. The first of those assaults began at around 8.30 a.m. with three brigades, Brigadier General Morgan L. Smith's division, which is Major General John A. Logan's 15th Corps, Army of the Tennessee. They did that by moving against Loring's Corps on the southern end of Little Kennesaw Mountain and the spur known as Pigeon Hill near the Burnt Hickory Road. All right, well, if that attack were successful, capturing Pigeon Hill would isolate Lawrence Corps and Kennesaw Mountain. Right. All three brigades were disadvantaged by the approach through dense thickets, steep and rocky slopes, and a lack of knowledge of the terrain. About 5,500 Union troops and two columns of regiments moved against about 5,000 Confederate soldiers who were well entrenched, though. You don't want to do, you don't want to do the well entrenched guys, man. Okay. Haven't we learned our lesson about uh, right. moving against well entrenched enemies? That's crazy. On the right of Smith's attack, the brigade of uh, Brigadier General Joseph Lightburn was forced to advance through a knee deep swamp and were stopped short of the Confederate breastworks on the southern end of Pigeon Hill by infilating fire. They were able to overrun the rifle pits in front of the works, but they could not pierce the main Confederate line. To the very left, the brigades of Colonel Charles Walcott and Brigadier General Giles Smith or Giles. Across difficult terrain interrupted by steep cliffs and scattered with huge rocks to approach the Missouri Brigade of Brigadier General Francis Cockrell. Man, dude, this is crazy. Some of the troops were able to reach as far as the Abatis, but most were not. Most were not able to, and they were forced to remain stationary, firing behind trees and rocks. Oh, wow. When General Logan rode forward to judge their progress, he determined that many of his men were being uselessly slain no reason. and ordered Walcott and Sm uh, Smith to withdraw and entrench behind the gorge that separated the line. I mean, don't you guys think you're going through all this stuff, you're using a tremendous amount of energy to sludge through mucky waters and climb up hills, and these guys are just sitting waiting. Right. I mean, come on. Uh, about two miles to the south, Thomas's troops were behind schedule, but began their main attack against Hardy's Corps at 9 a.m. All right. Two divisions, Army of Cumberland, about 9,000 men under Brigadier General John Newton, which is uh, Major General Oliver Howard's 4th Corps, and Brigadier General Jefferson C. Davis, which comes from Major General John M. Palmer's 14th Corps. They advanced in column formation rather than a typical broad line of battle against the Confederates. Confederate divisions of Major General Benjamin Cheatham and Patrick Claiborne. These guys were entrenched on what is known as Cheatham Hill. On Newton's left, his brigade under Brigadier General George Wagner attacked through dense undergrowth, but was unable to break through the abatis and fierce rifle fire. On his very right, the brigade of Brigadier General Charles Harker, they charged the Tennessee brigade of Brigadier General Alfred Vaughn. That's not supposed to be blue. Right, and was repulsed as well. During the second charge, Harker mortally wounded oh poor harker by many chuck <laughs> <laughs> davis's division to the right of newton's also advanced in column formation while such a movement offered the opportunity for a quick breakthrough by mass and power against a narrow point it also had the disadvantage of offering a large concentrated target to enemy guns yeah their orders were to advance silently capture the works and then cheer to give a signal to the reserve divisions to move forward to secure the railroad and cut the confederate army in two Colonel Daniel McCook's brigade advanced down a slope to a creek and then crossed a wheat field to ascend the slope of Cheatham Hill. Oh, he said, I'm coming for you. Here we go, baby. When they reached within a few yards of the rebel works, the line halted, crouched, and began firing. The rebel counterfire was too strong. Mm. McCook's brigade lost two commanders, McCook and his replacement, oh, Colonel no. Oscar Harmon. Oh, no. Nearly all of its field officers and a third of its men as well. Oh, no, McCook. McCook was murdered on the Confederate parapet as he slashed it with his sword and shouted, Surrender, you traitors. And they said, Die, you bastard. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you yank. I think they call him uh, British uh, sympathizers. Doubt it. No. Colonel John G. Mitchell's brigade on McCook's right suffered similar losses. Mm. But I bet you uh, Mitchell's alive. Right. After ferocious hand-to-hand -hand combat, the Union troops dug and crossed the Confederates, ending the fight in around 10.45 a.m. Both sides nicknamed the battlefield Dead Angle. Mm. Well, to the right of Davis's division, Major General John Gary's division of Major General Joseph Hooker's 20th Corps advanced, but did not join Davis's attack. Considerably far think after the battle is over, like two people waving a white flag, they go up like, All right, what's this one called? We're thinking uh, swampy mess or something. How about dead angle? 
It's good. Yeah, this, this, we're, we're, we're like at an angle here, and we got a lot of dead. Yeah. All right, all right. We'll Take it. <laughs> <laughs> Considerably farther to the right, however, was the site of the only success of the day for the Union. Schofield's army had been assigned to demonstrate against the Confederate left, and he was able to put two brigades across Ollie's Creek without resistance. Look at Schofield. Yeah. He's been on an uh, uptick. All right. Uptick. <laughs> the movement alongside, along with an advance by Major General George Stoneman's cavalry division on Schofield's right put Union troops within five miles of the Chattahoochee River, closer to the last river protecting Atlanta than any unit in Johnson's army. Oh, shit. Uh oh. Oh, man. Sherman's army suffered 3,000 casualties in comparison to Johnston's 1,000. Union General was not initially deterred by these losses, and he twice asked Thomas to renew the assault. He says this, Our loss is small compared to some of those battles in the East. Very true. Uh, Thomas replied, One or two more such assaults would use up this army. Yeah, man. You know, I mean, can't be just willy-nilly and getting your guys killed. Well, Sherman thought about that for a few days, and then he decided to write his wife. He wrote this in this letter. I begin to regard the death and mangling of a couple thousand men as a small fear, a kind of morning dash. Oh, my gosh. He's getting, insens he's getting insensitive to it all. Now. Right. He's like, I don't care. He's like, it's for the greater good, and right. we can always get more. They can't. <laughs> well, that's a shitty way of thinking, but I guess. <laughs> uh, Kenneth All Mountain was not Sherman's first large-scale frontal assault of the war, but it was his last. He interrupted a string of successful flanking maneuvers in the Atlanta campaign for the logistical reasons mentioned earlier, but also that he could keep Johnson guessing about the tactics he would employ in the future. Nice. In his report of the battle, Sherman wrote, I perceived that the enemy and our officers had settled down into a conviction that I would not assault fortified lines. All looked to me to outflank. An army to be efficient must not settle down to a single mode of offense, but must be prepared to execute any plan with promises success. You kidding. I wanted, therefore, for the moral effect to make a successful assault against the enemy behind his breastworks and resolve to attempt it at that point where success would give the largest fruits of victory. He, he said, we're not just going to stick to flanking, man. If right. we got an opportunity to chat, attack frontal, we're going to we're gonna missionary you this shit. Kid. <laughs> Kennesaw Mountain is usually considered a significant Union tactical defeat. But Richard M. McMurray, he wrote this. Tactically, Johnson had won a minor defensive triumph on Loring's and Hardy's lines. Schofield's success, however, gave Sherman a great advantage, and the federal commander quickly decided to exploit it. The opposing forces spent five days facing each other at close range. Damn. But on the 2nd of July, with good summer weather at hand, Sherman, he said, Army of Tennessee, Stoneman's Cavalry, he said, go take out that Confederate left flank. And then Johnson was forced to withdraw from Kennesaw Mountain to prepare positions at Smyrna. <laughs> Smyrna. <laughs> at Smyrna. <laughs> July 8, Sherman outflanked Johnson again for the first time on his right oh, by sending Schofield to cross the Chattahoochee near the mouth of the Sope Creek. Sope Creek? Soap Creek? The Look last at, uh, Sherman going with the high end. Right. And the smallest army. Right. The last major geographic barrier to enter in Atlanta had been overcome. Uh oh. Alarmed at the imminent danger. <laughs> I'm in danger. Right. Posts of the city of Atlanta and frustrated with the strategy of continual withdrawals. Oh, now you know what it feels like, old Jefferson. Right. Confederate President Jefferson Davis relieved Johnson of command July 17th, replacing him with the aggressive John Bell Hood, who we just said earlier that Hood uncharacteristically. Unchar Got soft. Um, uh, well, either way, Hood was temporarily promoted to full general there. Wow. Temporarily. Well, with Hood in charge, he proceeded to attack Sherman in battles at Peach Street Creek on the 20th of July, Atlanta and Decatur on the 22nd of July, and Ezra Church on the 28th, in all of which he suffered enormous casualties without tactical, dis mm -hmm. without tactical advantage. Sherman besieged Atlanta for the month of August, but he sent almost an entire force swinging to the south to cut off the city's last remaining railroad connection. Good for you. In the Battle of Jonesboro, which, which was, is the last one. Right, August 31st through the 1st of September. Yeah, you know, two dates. <laughs> uh, Hood attacked again to save his railroad, but guess what? Denied, and he was forced to evacuate Atlanta all mm -hmm. We're going to have some good battles coming up, oh, guys. Shit. Sherman's men and... Sherman's men entered the city September 2nd, and Sherman telegraphed President Lincoln. He says, Atlanta is ours, and fairly won. This milestone was arguably one of the key factors enabling Lincoln's re-election in November. Yeah, without that, uh, without Atlanta being captured, Lincoln probably would have lost. 
I don't know. He was facing McClellan, though. I mean, the battle was described from the perspective of Sam Watkins, who was a volunteer in the 1st Tennessee Infantry Regiment of the Confederate Army, in his book, or in a book called Company H. All right. The site of the battlefield is now part of the Kennesaw Mountain National Battlefield Park, where both Confederate deliberate trenches on top of the mountain and some Union rifle pits are still visible today. Nice. The American Battlefield Trust and its partners have saved almost four acres of battlefield land outside the park as of mid-2023. Fantastic. All right, dude. We're getting some progress down there in the south, huh? Damn right. Meanwhile, the Union held up in Virginia, but hey, we'll take it, right? Next week, we got Sapony Church. Sapony. Saponi, whatever, Saponi, Saponi Church, and the Wilson Colts Raid. And then we got First Ream Station, also in Atlanta. We've got the Battle of Monocacy, also, uh, that's, what's his name, Jubal Early. He's about to march towards Washington here. And I believe Fort Stevens is the one that's, Fort Stevens, yeah, that was the one where they came within like three miles, Fort Stevens. So we got uh, Washington under pressure next week, guys. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Lincoln shivering in his top hat. <laughs> oh, boy. Right. That'll be next week's battle. We got four of them. And, uh, yeah, some good stuff coming up uh, later on this 1864 with that. Make sure you go checking out our YouTube at Bang Dang Network. Answer that Spotify question. Give us a review on Apple or Spotify. Share us with your friends. And we shall be back next week for some slaughtering. Washington shaking in their boots right now. They don't know what they're going to do. Mm-hmm. And this will be the closest. it will be the last hurrah for the Confederates, pretty much. But uh, mm-hmm. we'll see you next week for some more Battles of the Mickens of War. We all the Mother Michiganders. We Bang, dang. Uh,